Alan Mendelssohn, The Boy from Mars by Daniel Pinkwater. Chapters 44, 45, and 46. Chapter 44. I never saw Alan Mendelssohn again. It's funny. I had a sort of feeling that I would never see him again when he dropped me off outside my house that night, after we got back from our adventure in the Waka Waka plane of existence. When I got home, I thought I was going to drop right into bed, but I got a sort of second wind. I ate my supper, listened to my parents holler at me for staying out too late, and then I felt wide awake. There was nothing in particular I wanted to do. I just sort of ran over the details of my adventure with Alan Mendelssohn and watched television with my family. On Saturday nights, I'm allowed to stay up late, so I got to watch the late news. It was some late news. It seemed that in the course of the evening, hundreds and thousands of people had called the television station, the police, the Air Force, the mayor, the White House, and each other to report UFO sightings. Now, these were not your usual lights in the sky. This was a real spaceship. They could see the rivets in the hull, scratches in the metal. They could even see into the windows. They could see guys wearing green sweaters inside working the controls. Lots of people had snapped pictures of the spaceship, which had hovered over the housetops of Hogborough and West Kangaroo Park for almost an hour. A couple of times the spaceship had seemed to land. The whole news program was about the UFO sighting and inter with interviews of the mayor, the chief of police, some science fiction writer who was visiting Hogborough, people who had seen the spaceship, everybody. My mother was scared. My father thought it was a publicity stunt for some movie. I thought it was real, just a spaceship visiting Hogborough. We had a big discussion about it. In the end, my father convinced my mother, which was good for me, because at one point she had made her mind up not to let me go out of the house anymore. I didn't convince anybody. My father said that if the spaceship were real, it would belong to the good old United States, and when the White House was called, the president would have explained the whole thing. He was absolutely sure that the whole thing was just a promotion for some space movie that would be coming to a local theater in a week or two. It was nice to have a family discussion. Even if my parents were completely wrong about everything, we usually didn't have anything to talk about. In the morning, I wanted to hear what Alan Mendelssohn would have to say about the spaceship, although, as I said, I had this funny feeling that Alan Mendelssohn was gone. It was just a feeling, though. I didn't have any reason to believe it was true. When I got to Alan Mendelssohn's house, it was obvious that the whole family had gone. The windows of the house were dark. The Sunday paper was lying on the porch, the comic section sort of flapping in the wind. There was a big burned spot in the middle of the front lawn, as though there had been a campfire there the night before, only there were no ashes, just burnt grass. I had a heavy feeling in my stomach as I stepped onto the porch. I rang the bell, but I knew nobody was going to answer. I could hear the chimes making a hollow sound inside the house. I peeked in the window. The house was completely empty. There wasn't a single piece of furniture, a rug, even the place where the telephone had been was just a bunch of wires coming out of the wall. Alan Mendelssohn and his fam family were totally, completely, and forever gone. Pinned next to the front door was a lumpy brown manila envelope. Written across it was my name, Leonard. Inside was the brass potato from the moon that Alan Mendelssohn had gotten from William Lloyd Floyd and a note to me. Dear Leonard, I had to leave with my family. We're going back to the Bronx, if you know what I mean. I'm sorry to leave like this without giving you any warning, but I had to promise a certain person that I wouldn't tell anybody about this. Not even my best friend, and that's you. This certain person, 
I had to promise not to mention his name, but he's a sort of high commissioner of a certain place. You've seen him. I'll try to get a note to you sometime, but it isn't easy to get mail from the Bronx to this place. In the meantime, please don't forget about your old friend, Alan Mendelssohn. P.S. The Fleegix is much better where I'm going. So he really was a... No, it could have been just another joke. I mean, if Alan Mendelssohn was really from... Why didn't he ever tell me? But of course, he had told me. He had told everybody. I just couldn't tell what was true. And I didn't care. All I knew was that my only friend had left. And I felt miserable. Chapter 45 I just dragged myself around all day Sunday. I really missed Alan Mendelssohn. I was mad at him for a while for leaving and not telling me anything about it. But really, it wasn't his fault if he promised Rawls up that he wouldn't tell anybody he was going back to Mars or the Bronx. I couldn't make up my mind if the whole thing about being from Mars was a put-on or not. I hung around the house, watching television and looking at my brass moon potato. Another thing which bugged me was that I wanted to ask Alan Mendelssohn a lot of questions about what happened in Waka Waka. I wanted to know how he guessed that the Wazel was really Manny, Moe, and Jack. I wanted to ask him what he and Ralzup had talked about, although I now had a pretty good idea of that. They had talked about Alan Mendelssohn and his family getting a ride home to Mars on a UFO. That is, if the Mars story was true. Something else I'd never be able to find out. Dr. Prince telephoned me to tell me that he was back from his trip and expected to see me in his office the following afternoon. I figured I might as well go. Dr. Prince was sort of a jerk, but at least he was somebody to talk to, and it meant I would get out of school early. Something funny happened at school the next day. I was sort of depressed at first, and then I got angry. I felt impatient with everybody. I did something I had never done before. I tripped a kid. It wasn't as good as one of Alan Mendelssohn's trips, but it was a pretty good. It had some style. Did you trip me? The kid asked. Yes, Featherbrain, I said. Care to make something of it? The kid I tripped was a lot bigger than me, but I didn't care. If he wanted to fight, I'd only be too glad. I really felt like getting into a fight. The kid didn't want to fight, though. He just walked away. I was disappointed. In my social studies class, they were talking about the Crusades. The teacher was talking about how the Crusaders were these real brave romantic types who were models of morality and all that. Except they never took a bath, I heard myself say. What's that you said, Uh, Leonard? The teacher was sort of surprised to hear my voice. I guess I hadn't said anything in that class before. They never washed. They stank. They used to douse themselves with perfume so they could stand being around each other. And they all had fleas, I said. I was really enjoying myself. "Uh, Leonard, the teacher said, I don't know where you got such a disgusting idea. I know there's nothing about this in our social studies textbook. They were dirty and smelly and flea-bitten, I said, and they pushed people around and stole stuff. I- I've got a couple books all about it on the all about the Crusades at home. I- I'll bring them in tomorrow and read to everybody about what slobs the Crusaders were. I'm sure that won't be necessary, Leonard, the teacher said. Oh, it won't be any trouble, I said. I'll bring the books in tomorrow, for sure. I was out of my seat and pacing up and down in the aisle. The teacher had this horrified expression. She was hoping I wouldn't bring in my books that told about the filthy personal habits of the Crusaders. I was going to, though. I was starting to feel very light and happy. My next class was gym. This was the one class I really had been afraid of. 
Most of the time, Mr. Jarris just ignored me, but at least once a week he'd chew me out. I don't think it was anything personal. There were quite a few kids who didn't like Jim, and Mr. Jarris would abuse all of them. Every so often, it was my turn. I was always afraid that each time I went into the gym class, it would be my turn. I always felt sick on my way to gym. This time, I didn't. I wandered in a couple of minutes late. I was late sort of on purpose. I had made a point of taking the longest way possible to the gymnasium. Well, well, we're glad to have you with us, fatso, Mr. Jarrah said. I walked up to the front of the class, which was all spread out for calisthenics. Mr. Jarrus, I said, the next time you call me fatso or tubby or lard butt or anything like that, you're going to find yourself meeting with the principal, the PTA, and maybe appearing in a court of law with that stupid whistle in your mouth. My only regret is that my father, Judge Nebel, will have to disqualify himself because I'm his son. But I'm sure you'll get a fair trial before a judge who will listen to all the arguments before he convicts you of verbally abusing me, finds you, gets your teaching certificate revoked, and maybe throws you in jail. Actually, my father has a rag business, but Mr. Jarris didn't know that. Nebel, come to my office, Mr. Jarris said. He didn't roar it in his usual way. He almost sounded like a regular human being. I followed him to his office. Leonard, Mr. Jarris said when we went in his office, we've started a corrective gym class. It's for kids there's something wrong with. Uh, bad posture, fallen arches, and, and kids who aren't regular, like you. I mean... No offense, Leonard, but you don't really want to climb ropes and get into the Marine Corps and kill your country's enemies, do you? I said that it wasn't one of my big goals in life. Well, maybe you'd like me to get you into this corrective gym class where you can study toe dancing and grow up to be a little commie sissy boy, Mr. Jarris said. I told him I'd like that just fine and it would solve the problem of Mr. Jarris having to appear in court to explain why he was insulting, stupid, and ignorant. He sent me over to the corrective gym class right away. He said he'd take care of the paperwork later. The corrective gym teacher was Mr. Winkle. He told us later that he never wanted to be a gym teacher, but there was a job open, so he took it. The class met in an empty classroom, not a regular gym. Mr. Winkle said he didn't care if we got any exercise or not. He said we could play chess or read comics if we didn't feel like participating in the class. For kids who didn't know how to play chess, he suggested that those of us who knew could teach the others. He said that after everybody knew how to play, he'd give a five-minute chess lesson at the beginning of each period. For the gym part of the class, Mr. Winkle said he would teach us yoga. He had a paperback book called Yoga Made Simple. He said he didn't know anything about yoga himself, and he'd be learning right along with us. Most of the kids decided to give yoga a try. The exercises were easy. Most of the beginning ones could be done sitting or lying on the floor. Mr. Winkle's paperback said that by the end of the book, anyone who did the exercises would be really supple and strong. I liked the idea that Mr. Winkle was doing the exercises right along with us. Jim went from being my least favorite part of school to the class I liked best in 10 minutes. The corrective gym class was made up of all the weird kids, Henry Bagel and all those kids that everybody who was regular picked on, the ones who had picked on me before Alan Mendelssohn turned up. I was ready to start tripping kids and offering to fight but everybody was sort of nice to me. It seems that when there aren't any of the regular kids around, the weirdos didn't mind each other's company so much. Also, we knew we were the weirdo gym class. There was no point in pretending anything else. Even Mr. Winkle looked like he had been a weirdo when he was a kid. I sort of liked him. We all did. 
The gym class made me feel kind of good, and for the rest of the day I didn't trip anybody or pick on any teachers. I left school early with permission so I could go to my appointment with Dr. Prince. I had already decided not to bother Dr. Prince with the story of what had happened in Waka Waka. I just was going to tell him regular everyday stuff. Dr. Prince had a suntan and he kept jumping and looking around as though he expected something to be hiding behind his chair. Except for that, he seemed to have recovered nicely from going crazy in the Bermuda Triangle chili parlor. I told him how I tripped a kid and talked back to my teachers. He seemed really happy about that. He said I was getting my aggression out in the open. Dr. Prince was a little slow on the uptake, but I guess his heart was in the right place. When I got home, I was still sad about not having a best friend anymore, but I was feeling sort of good about school. I did a lot of extra homework. I was planning to do a lot of talking in class the next day. Chapter 46 What was happening was that I was taking over Alan Mendelssohn's old job at Bat Masterson Junior High School. It made me miss him less to do the sorts of things he used to do. I drove teachers crazy by bringing up all sorts of weird stuff in classes. In order to get away with it, I had to be sure I was ahead of the class so I wouldn't get shot down on tests. Then I'd have to do a lot of outside reading in order to come up with little-known but absolutely authentic facts to throw at the teacher. There's a gentle art to bugging teachers. You have to sort of pace yourself or you'll spoil it. Sometimes I'd be quiet for a week or more. This was to lull the teacher into a false sense of security. Then I'd spring the results of my latest research and take over the class for a day or two. By rotating classes, I was able to create an explosion in one, or, in one class or another once or twice a week. I started out to develop a tripping program like Alan's, and even spent some time trying to develop a missile whistle like his, but I wasn't really able to get into it. Besides, I found that I didn't hate all the kids in school as much as I thought I did. Part of that had to do with the corrective gym class. After the first few days, the kids in the class started to eat lunch together. At first, the other kids called us names like the Awkward Squad and the Freak Show. Then we started practicing our yoga exercises during lunch. Even after only two weeks, most of us could get into some positions that would really hurt you if you were tense or didn't know what you were doing. Some of the regular kids found this out when they tried to imitate what we were doing. One kid sprained his ankle trying to imitate the dying chicken posture. You have to know what you're doing or you can really get hurt doing yoga. I turned out to be the best chess player in the corrective gym class. Anytime we felt tired or not interested, Mr. Winkle would let us knock off the yoga and play chess, provided that we didn't make noise and disturb the other kids. Also, we found out that Mr. Winkle came to school a half hour early and did some jogging around the track. We asked him if we could come and jog with him. He said okay, and after that some of us, whoever felt like it, would show up just about every morning. A lot of the kids in the corrective gym class were good students. Some of them were in the same classes with me. They liked the Alan Mendelssohn imitation I was doing, and sometimes they would back me up. After a while, some of us started to team up on research projects so we could really confound our teachers. So the next time grades came out, I discovered I was getting all A's, even in gym. My parents were pleased, and so was Dr. Prince, who took all the credit for everything. My parents wanted to give me a present for straightening out and getting good grades and not being crazy anymore. I told them I wanted to throw a party. They said okay, and I wound up taking the whole corrective gym class and Mr. Winkle out for a meal at the Bermuda Triangle Chili Parlor. I hadn't been there since Alan Mendelssohn disappeared. I thought it would depress me too much, but I felt like taking all my friends there. I considered inviting Dr. Prince too, but I remembered the bad experience he'd had there and decided not to even mention it to him. 
So there we were, enjoying our second helpings of green death chili, when who should walk in but Samuel Klugarsh. Leonard, my old pupil, Samuel Klugarsh shouted. Where have you been all these weeks? I've been meaning to come see you, Mr. Klugarsh, I said. I've got a message for the mad guru. Will you tell him that his brother, Lance Hergeschleimer, is alive and well and living in Waka Waka? We know all about it, Samuel Klugarsh said. Klugarsh, extraplanar scientific associates, has been getting a lot of brand new information of late. But I'm so glad to see you. I've got a message for you, too. Clarence Yojimbo was here a few weeks ago and wanted to get in touch with you, but I never did know where you lived. The folk singing thing in New York didn't work out, you know. Poor fellow, he was very disappointed. Wants to go into the health food business in the 14th existential plane of Saturn. What did Clarence Yojimbo want to see me about? I asked. He wanted to give you something, Samuel Klugar said. In fact, he left it with me. If you like, I'll just nip around to the shop and get it. Then I'll come back and you can introduce me to your friends and we'll have three or four bowls of green death together. Samuel Klugar rushed out of the Bermuda Triangle chili parlor. He was back in two minutes with a strange metallic envelope in his hand. I opened it. Inside was a note on a sheet of something that looked like metal, but felt like plastic. It was from Alan Mendelssohn. It said, Dear Leonard, My parents want you to ask your parents if it would be okay for you to spend your summer vacation with me here in the Bronx, if you know what I mean. If they say yes, our friend Rouse Up will be able to arrange all the details. Your friend, Alan Mendelssohn. So ends chapter 46, and so ends Alan Mendelssohn, The Boy from Mars by Daniel Pinkwater.